all right everyone i hope uh so once people start figuring out they're gonna start coming upstairs so welcome everyone to another dive live at the sunken bloom stage it's officially 7 p.m and i'd like to welcome everyone to the sunken bloom stage today we have a very special dive live prepared for you guys of a with a very special guest if you guys don't know yet hello kev if you guys don't know yet uh we are starting right now with the first presentation on the topic of biophilia and this is a very interesting topic requested by some of our community members uh you know and we have been preparing this awesome 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 series of dive lives for you guys if you don't know what a dive life is well these are virtual presentations happening on the sunken bloom stage where each week a speaker takes over the stage presents about whatever topic they would like to uh, and then recently we started doing the dive life series where we bundle a bunch of these speakers within the same topic so far we have presentations on the theme of architecture design art uh, we had finance, even neurology. We have neurologists on the stage presenting different topics and different procedures. Uh, we've had comedy, uh, graphic design, you name it. You know, whatever crazy stuff there is in the world, we've had someone present in a virtual stage. And we are growing tremendously. We're so thankful for our amazing community who has been, you know, being part of this and making this such a good experience. And Without further ado, I would like to introduce our amazing speaker, our very first speaker in the Biophilia series, Elizabeth Calabrese. And Elizabeth, if you guys don't know, she is a licensed architect and leading educator in the biophilic design. Uh, her focus in promoting, uh, is promoting human and environmental health and well-being by connecting humans to nature and each other in the built environment. She has national and international projects to her credit and believes that ecolo uh, ecology and biophilia belong at the foundational core of the professional design and engineering programs. As a consultant, she encourages a holistic, integrated ecosystem approach when incorporating biophilia into projects, including those seeking living building challenges and well-building certification. Elizabeth co-authored the practice of biophilic design uh, with Dr. Stephen Keller and uh, the pioneer of biophilic design in 2015. So thank you so much, Elizabeth, for being here with us. And everyone can clap by pressing the letter C, by the way. <laughs> thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to have you here on stage. So without further ado, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Mathis. I, uh, I was... Uh, I think I lost your audio. Uh, can you hear us, Elizabeth? Yep. Oh, yep, yep. I'm there here we now. Go. There we go. <laughs> so I, I'm having trouble sitting down. I think my wings are in the way. But it's so <laughs> nice to uh, it's so nice to be here, and I'm so excited to be a biophilia fairy. Um, I'm 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 presenting from New Orleans, <coughs> so I think this might be my next Mardi Gras costume. What? Um, let's see, I'm just trying to come forward here. Okay. So, welcome to this presentation, Biophilic Holism. Um, let's see, all right. So, if we consider, if we consider the world and, and as it evolved, um, going on. Wait, hang on. Um, that is we're having a problem with the... Okay. Let's start over. Oh, not a problem. Yeah, for some reason it got away from me. Anyway, um, if we consider the sun um, and the world, you know, the world exploded 4.5 billion years ago it started. And at the beginning of time, there was sunshine. And the sunshine changes colors throughout the day. And there are sunrises and sunsets and high and low pressure move the air. And weather patterns swirl around the globe and volcanoes erupt and mountains and valleys rise and fall and the single-celled organisms became more complex and 
The earth was rich with water and air and nutrients, and it was self-healing. And, and in this little sketch, I mean, it shows nature, and it's not chaotic. It's covered by the laws of nature, and it's full of information richness, and it makes sense. It's organized complexity. And over time, plants and animals evolved in their unique landscapes and ecosystems. And there were grasslands and deserts and tundra and mountains and valleys and oceans and lakes and rivers and spectacular waterfalls. So Homo sapiens showed up on the African savanna, evolved about 2,000, 200,000 to 300,000 years ago. And we were on the African savanna. And, um, and that's an area that we're very comfortable being in. Um, and since that's where we evolved, we're actually very comfortable in those types of environments. We hunted animals and they hunted us. And as a, indigenous um, beings, we were one with nature. And it wasn't until 12,000 years ago that we actually were no longer hunter-gatherers and we started to grow food at a larger scale. And over time, our tools and shelters got more sophisticated. we built shelters we had windows that let in air and natural daylight and moonlight and unfortunately those who are technology technologically more advanced massacred and colonized indigenous peoples and their knowledge and their ancient wisdom was deemed barbaric and obsolete And then the invention of the elevator, it allowed buildings to get increasingly taller and the materials, methods, and technology increased. And with an endless supply of fossil fuel, it allowed us to defy natural system too. And then air conditioning became commonplace and it further shifted the building design and design Designs were no longer bioclimatic, so they no longer responded to the built environment the way they did for so long before technology and fossil fuel. So now, now we live in these hermetically sealed buildings made of glass with windows that don't open. We breathe mechanical air. We force rivers into culverts and cover landscapes with concrete and asphalt. And we cool glass high rises by pumping hot air into the atmosphere with a not so endless supply of fossil fuel. So recently, like in the past 200 years, we've forgotten that we're part of nature. And at one point we were one with it and technology was just a tool. But we seem to have forgotten that. And technology seems to be driving how we build the built environment. Um, and we've lost aspect to, to, to the point that nature, that we are nature and that nature is life. And now we spend 90% of our time inside of these built environments. So now we're flooded with data and so often we ignore ancient wisdom. And it's interesting because in this great day and age, our depression is rising and anxiety and suicide and obesity and isolation, they're all on the rise. And uh, technology is so often used to dominate nature and not work with it. So it seems that we've gotten ourselves into a mess on many levels and, and it's our physiological well-being that's at stake, um, as well as the balance and health of the natural world. And we hear that over and over on the news now that's happening. So this 
word biophilia is quite significant. First time it was ever used was in 1964 by a, a German born American psychoanalyst named Eric Fromm. And he was, was analyzing the psychological traits of leaders such as, such as Stalin and Hitler and Mussolini. Uh oh. That button, you guys. And uh, the quote where he first introduced the word biophilia, he said, I've been able to distinguish between various kinds of aggression, which directly or indirectly are in service of life. And that malignant form of destructiveness, necrophilia, which is a true love of death, as opposed to biophilia, which is the love of life. Love of life, independence, and the overcoming of narcissism form a syndrome of growth against the syndrome of decay formed by love of death, incestuous symbiosis, and malignant narcissism. And that's a really heavy, heavy statement there. And then in 1973, he further defines, come on here, I didn't back that. He further defines um, biophilia as the passionate love of life and all that is alive. So it's interesting that the first time the word biophilia was used, it was, it was used because of destruction. And I kind of feel like we're at that point now with the destruction of the natural world and climate change. Um, so this idea of malignant narcissism and, and our the way we treat the natural world is actually once again significant. So then going forward, in a 1984, E.O. Wilson, who is an entomologist from Harvard, um, wrote a book, Biophilia, and he had noticed that when he looked out over a landscape, he felt this connection that was so strong in him that he realized that, that it was his connection to nature, and he felt that that was his connection to nature in his DNA. And the quote from his book, Biophilia, he said, Biophilia is the innate tendency to focus on life and lifelike processes. From infancy, we concentrate happily on ourselves and other organisms. We learn to distinguish life from the inanimate and move toward, toward it like a moth to a porch light. To explore and affiliate with life is a deep and complicated process in mental development. To an extent still undervalued in philosophy and religion, our existence depends on this propensity. Our spirit is woven from it and hope rises on its current. powerful stuff and I went ahead and had backed up to the picture of the hunter-gatherers on the savannah um, but now looking forward in 1993 Stephen Keller who's the pioneer of biophilic design he got together with E.O. Wilson and they wrote the book um, they edited the book the biophilia hypothesis and it had um, contributors across disciplines and they were all looking at this idea of biophilia. And in that book, Steve says, the human need for nature is linked not to just material exploitation of the environment, but also to influence the natural world on our emotional, cognitive, aesthetic, and even spiritual development. Even the tendency to avoid, reject, and at times destroy elements of the natural world can be viewed as an extension of an innate need to relate deeply and intimately with the vast spectrum of life around us. Now, Stephen Keller was a social ecologist, so he looked at the way we connected to the natural world. And then in 2008, he started getting this idea about biophilic design. It was slowly evolving. And um, he uh, edited the book with uh, the book Biophilic Design, and one of the contributors was Bill Browning and Tim Beatley, who will be talking later on this month about biophilic design. So that's kind of cool. And the quote from Steve from this book, and this is one of the most significant quotes. He says, biophilic design is not about greening our buildings or simply increasing their aesthetic appeal through inserting trees and shrubs. Much more, it's about humanity's place in nature and the natural world's place in human society. So how are we connected to nature and how is nature connected to us? 
so this funny little sketch, uh, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but often I'm seeing buildings that are just draped in plants or terraces draped in plants or offices draped in plants and they're deemed biophilic. And if you think about what Steve has said, it's much more than just plants. Um, it's about humanity's place in nature and the natural world's uh, place in human society. So if we look at, if we go back to the natural world and think about how we respond to space, you know, we evolved knowing and roaming and exploring and finding where we could flourish and thrive to procreate. So we have that in our, in our DNA, how to, how to find space where we can flourish and thrive. And in the natural world, this is a very aggressive um, environment right here. It's quite hostile. So we've done the same thing in the built environment. You know, we've created these hostile spaces that have no life, um, where we don't feel comfortable and we don't flourish and thrive. And actually, we're also hurting the natural environment in these types of spaces. And I know I'm being a little exaggerating and, and excessive, but I'm making a point here. And that's the nice thing about an artistic license here. So now we've had the ability to design hostility and helplessness and disease and stress and aggression and fight or flight and placelessness into our built environment. But if you look at the drawing on the other side of the, of the slide, we can also design a different world. And that's what biophilic design is about. You know, we can, we can design altruism and confidence and health and ease and relaxation, a sense of place. We can create community by how we build our spaces and uh, design and build our spaces and a sense of interconnectedness and, and hopeless, uh, hopefulness. Now, in 2015, Steve and I co-authored the Practice of Biophilic Design monograph and it's free online. And, um, that, and that monograph was the first time that Steve brought forth principles of biophilic design. And the whole idea behind this type of design is to foster a repeated and sustained engagement with nature, uh, to focus on human adaptations to the natural world that over evolutionary time have advanced people's health, fitness, and well-being. So think about food and exercise, a community, all, all the things that we need the way back, way back when. And it encourages an emotional attachment to particular settings and places so that not one, all, one size fits all. Um, it's specific to the culture and the ecology. And it promotes positive interactions between people and nature that encourage an expanded sense of responsibility and stewardship for the human and natural communities. So it's about connecting people to nature, but also connecting people to each other in a healthier way environment and it encourages ecologically connected mutually reinforced and integrated design solutions so this is where the holism comes up this is where it's not just putting some plants out but it's creating supportive symbiotic systems um, that we live in that also support the natural environment and in this uh, sketch, I mean, it might look like some place you've gone in Italy or I'm down in New Orleans, you know, the balconies, the materials, the textures, um, spaces for birds, uh, lots of light and air, you know, weather patterns you can enjoy by opening your balcony and stepping out and waving to people. It's a very social environment. And when it's designed right, it connects to the natural landscapes and to the ecosystem and the buildings that respond to the climate as well. And when you're designing biophilically, there are other ways to bring nature into your environment. And it can be actually indirectly by images of nature and natural materials. You know, here we've got indirect experiences by the stone and the brick and the ironwork can have shapes of nature. Um, ceiling fans can simulate natural flowing air. Really great lighting that's warm and comfortable can simulate your firelight. 
you know, they're naturalistic shapes and forms. And if you consider a biophilic streetscape, there's a lot of information richness. It's not, it's not monotonous. Um, it's sort of like walking through the woods because you're looking at, at, at these natural shapes and people. And it's, it can be a very organic and alive feeling. Um, often these natural materials have age, change, and patina of time. You know, they're, they're, they're not a static material. And uh, natural ge geometries. One of the attributes of um, biophilic design is actually biomimicry. And that's one uh, word that often gets confused with biophilic design, with biophilia or biophilic design. And biomimicry is when you take uh, the brilliance of nature and use that to solve a problem like uh, you know birds uh, can influence how they made velcro for instance and uh, so biomimicry can be a smaller portion of biophilic design but if we look at the built environment as an eco mimetic design where we're eco we're mimicking an ecosystem then all of a sudden eco mimicry is an overarching way of design and so that's important to keep in mind. Um, and also aspects of biophilic design would be prospect and refuge, where you feel protected at your back and you're looking out over a landscape and organized complexity, as I was talking about earlier in the savanna. And um, transition spaces, those are colonnades and porches and balconies where you're kind of inside outside space, you're social, but you're protected. And then mobility and wayfinding is a way to know where you're going and know how to get home. And our hunter-gatherer ancestors really had to have um, the, those skills of mobility and wayfinding. And, and we can introduce that in the built environment by the patterns of the sidewalk and the materials and the lighting. And then the cultural and ecological attachment to place. And this next it's just a quick little sketch showing, you know, we've got our standard six glass high rise on the left, and then we have this organic shape. And sometimes people think that if a building is organic, it's automatically biophilic. And that's not necessarily the case. If you start looking across that little, oops, somebody's touching the screen. Don't, don't touch the screen, guys. Um, that center bit, you know, it's organic on the left, but it doesn't necessarily make it biophilic. You know, biophilic would be responding in a bioclimatic way. It responds to the, with the water, with the sunlight. Um, it's connecting people to nature. It's not just like a sculpture that, that's dropped onto earth um, that's disconnected uh, from everywhere else. And, um, Often in schools of architecture, where architects sometimes look at architecture as a sculpture, something independent. It's this, this beautiful sculpture that's dropped down. Guys. Yeah. Hang on. Oops. Here we go. So, anyway. So the, the little sketch on the right just shows something that's more biophilic. It shows you know, shading by greenery in the summertime and beehives and bird houses and windows that open and shades. They're just so excited to see what happens next. So anyway, on the right, it just shows a more biophilic environment. And there again, these are just little sketches, but, but if you can get the essence of what I'm talking about in terms of the materials and proportions of space and how it interacts with people and the natural environment. So then in thinking of scales, we've got just like your, your, your room or your house, and then you could have a biophilic neighborhood or a biophilic community. And then you've got regional and, and natural resources, how those are impacted by a biophilic environment. And ultimately the goal of biophilic design is to promote human and ecological well-being. 
So my hope is that tomorrow, if you guys, when you walk out your door, you'll, you'll put on your biophilic lens and, um, and think about the space around you. What are your favorite spaces and what are the attributes of those spaces? And, um, and the spaces that you really hate and you avoid at all costs. If you start analyzing those spaces, you start understanding why you feel more alive and happier in certain spaces, why you like to sit in a restaurant in a certain spot, why you like to sit and read in another spot. And also why when you sit out at the beach and you're lost in just the waves, you get the most amazing thoughts and you can problem solve because your mind goes into soft fascination. This idea of, of your mind relaxes and, and your creativity just comes forth. And uh, so there's so many amazing things that happen when we connect back with nature. And, um, and biophilic design is a way to start doing that more so in our built environment. All right. Cool. Well, <laughs> um, well, awesome, you Elizabeth. Save the world. Go help parents save the world. Well, Professor Elizabeth, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, this was, you know, really cool to see the, in a way, this nar narrative, right? You walked us through this narrative of what is biophilia through a set of sketches and doodles, drawings that you've done. And I think this puts in perspective, you know, from the history when humans started, you know, roaming this planet to right now the need that we have to go back to you know living in this ecosystem right and i i say this because that's something that really stuck to me when we actually told uh talked in not in person right but in fa face to face uh before this dive live and you said that biophilia wasn't about the plant itself but it's about this ecosystem right and this idea that we don't live by ourselves as uh, individual people right even in society we are communicating with others we are interacting with others and the same goes with other species in a way you know and other elements living or non-living uh, right we are all intertwined in this planet so the idea of bringing that to the built environment is truly fascinating and um, uh, I don't necessarily have a question I would like to open for everyone if you guys have any question or any comment feel free to open your mic and the the floor is open now any questions one one of the things that i one of the things that i do want to say um and it was really interesting this is uh steve kellert's um feeling was that biophilia was the missing link to sustainability. So as sustainability became this big push, often buildings were kind of losing what made them so alive. And um, so bringing the life and soul back to buildings through biophilia and having them energy efficient and working with natural systems and processes is really the way forward. And um, so yeah, it's 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 very exciting because it it provides hope. You know, it shows us a way forward. Any other questions? I have one question. Uh, actually, your opinion. I know we're we are currently in a virtual stage talking about connection to nature. So my question to you would be: Do you think <laughs> virtual spaces? You know, there's place for biophilia in a virtual environment. Um, you know, I do. I, I think that there is. What I would like to do next, I wasn't able to do it this time, is using this virtual space, we could actually take something that was extremely unbiophilic and transform it three-dimensionally. And that would be a lot of fun. Uh, but in just looking around the space, I mean, you've got the collaborate with platforms in order to all right someone um, was you... unmuted but it's muted now okay 
I mean, just looking at the carpet and the, the, the roundness of the carpet and the colors and the patterns of the carpet and then the wood on the floor. And we've got, you know, the, the stingray, you know, swimming around and the curves. And you know, if we were also managing water um, and, and air and light, I mean, we could just create this amazing space three dimensionally and, and to be able to show people how to do it. And it gets a little tricky on a, on a slide to explain it, but if we could you know, show the ecosystem around the stage and how you're tying into it, it, it would be really cool. Um, I, I cannot hear Danny. Uh, Danny, are you saying something? If there are any, aren't any questions, I guess my question is, how can you teach me to dance? Okay. I'm highly professional, creative, and above all, I hold the relevant you, uh, you want to dance. Okay, number one to five. Line with the expectations of you. Now, the past experiences I have relevant to this role include previous stints as an architect of both small and medium sized organizations, whereby I was often working with a diverse range of clients, of complex architecture. Um, I have one question. Um, hey, thanks. Um, are there any buildings um, that you can point out or like provide as an example of good biophilic design? Um, something that you know we can go out and experience and hopefully get inspired by. Well, I mean, there are quite a few. What happens is a lot of the older buildings that were built before technology are quite, quite biophilic. Um, and it's the newer ones that sometimes aren't. And uh, for instance, Grand Central Terminal is amazingly biophilic. If you look at how people interact with it, um, it's not necessarily connected to um, manage rainwater and um, and whatnot, not, but just looking at the attributes within Grand Central Station, it's it's a pretty great example. Um, I'm trying to think right off um, of other places, um, but usually places where people love to sit and congregate, and it's comfortable and it feels soulful, are often biophilic. So if you start looking around to what your favorite spaces are, you'll realize that they are. Um, it's not rocket science. You know, like a front porch sitting on a swing with your your family and there's gardens out in your yard and people are swinging, you know, coming by and, and talking with you. You know, they're walking down the street and you're meeting your neighbors. Yeah, that's a very biophilic situation and it's and it's super basic um so it doesn't need to be a complex situation i see uh, that makes sense uh, are you, you listening now yes are you listening now okay, okay good thank you Thank you so much for your presentation. I love it and I really love this uh, subject to talk about biophilia and I do interior design and I, I'm always trying to, to in a certain way to do this connection with nature for my clients. My question for you is, um, do you think we can uh, sometimes fake a little bit sometimes we don't have the nature so available to use for interior design uh, for example paintings or frames or pictures or fake plants do you think it can fake to our brain or no it needs to be nature real nature 
Well, it, it can be both. I mean, the, there, there's the direct experience of nature, and then there's the indirect experience of nature that also can, can be biophilic. So you're right. That is pictures of nature. It's natural materials. You know, for instance, this carpet um, I'm standing on virtually is, is very biophilic, even though it doesn't have pictures of plants on it. Um, so it is, uh, you can achieve a biophilic space indirectly. And uh, it's just knowing when, when is it appropriate and when is it not. Um, there was a situation where there was a building above ground and these fellows have put thousands of, of um, uh, speakers with bird sound throughout this large building that was above grade. And, and I felt that that was not an appropriate application above grade. If it was in a subway or an area with no access to nature, then it would make sense. But if you have a building above grade creating a courtyard and bird habitat and balconies and managing your water and having a fountain that becomes an ecosystem as you manage your rainwater, that would be the more biophilic approach. I get it. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much. It was really good. And you know, bef uh, for a time, uh, time ago, I didn't believe uh, it. the fake one will be okay. But I started doing this metaphor thing and start using the, the Oculus and start doing for different places, amazing places. And the feeling is so good. Even though it's not real, you can feel this inside, this, this gratitude for the amazing uh, nature places. So I think maybe I'm changing my mind now and listen to you. It's really good to understand better. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I think it's being appropriate. Making, making design decisions mindfully. Um, sometimes people will say, oh, you know, biophilic design is too expensive. And that's not necessarily the case. I think good design is often biophilic. And, and climate-inspired and informed design is the way to go, and that ultimately ends up biophilic. So um, I think it's just once you start looking through a biophilic lens, things start to shift how you see the world and also how you design the world. Thank you, yeah, so it's Thank you so much. Amazing. is the fact I'm someone who always... Oh, was somebody asking a question? Okay.
Thank you. Thank you so much.